corner. So, uh, but it's really good to be with you this morning. And if you guys haven't heard the pastor's message from last week on the vision of the church, I would suggest watching the video. It was really good. I'm really excited about this year. And uh, thank you for having me be the first preacher. <laughs> Always fun. So today I'm going to be speaking about a change of heart. And uh, when we hear change of heart, it often is used to express that someone has changed their mind or changed their opinion on something. Like when you, you know, go to the shop and you find out a, a new top that maybe isn't quite the same kind of style that you normally wear and you go, yes, I can pull this off. And you get home and then you're like, I no longer think I can pull this off. You can either return it or maybe put it in the back of the wardrobe and you never wear it. I know no one has done this. But that is having a change of heart. But today I want to talk about it in a little bit of a different light. I want to talk about when something inside of you changes. Now, I'm not saying like an actual heart transplant, but sometimes we need things in our heart our physical blood pumping heart, but in our heart to change. Maybe we've had some wrong thoughts, maybe we aren't thinking about others the way that we should, or maybe we aren't born again. That is where I'm going to start. The first change of heart I want to talk about is when we get saved. When you get born again, you have a change of heart. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Going from red to white isn't a color change that we can do on our own. I don't know if you've ever uh, dyed anything. Have you dyed it red? Maybe you're making icing for a cake, and you put you know, your red food coloring in there, and you mix it up. There is no way to ever get that back to white. Mm. But with God, there is a way. Colossians 1.13 says, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son. When you get born again, you make a complete turnaround. You change from one thing into another. You move from darkness into light. Changed from condemned to free. Moved from unrighteousness into righteousness. Mm. You have been made righteous. Righteous is the ability to stand in the presence of the Father without a sense of guilt or inferiority. Mm. As if sin had never existed. Mm. When Adam and Eve did wrong and sin entered the world, uh, we lost that righteousness. We lost that standing. But through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we were made righteous again. We have been put in a position of right standing with God. And the Bible says that when you repent, God takes that sin and throws it as far as the east is from the west. That's a really far distance. Mm. And it's like that that sin was never there. We've been washed clean of it. 1 John 1, 9 says, But if you confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. And then Ezekiel 36, And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. That is our first change of heart. Changing from a heart of stone to a tender, new heart. Being translated from that kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Taking our scarlet sin and washing it clean in white as snow. That is probably the greatest change of heart that you can ever have. And really, the most important one that you will ever have. But the second change of heart happens after that. So, that change is changing what you think on and what you put in front of you, what you listen to. Romans 12, verse 2 says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing 
and perfect. In the new international version, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. We are in this world, but we're not supposed to be like the world. We are supposed to be different. And that starts with changing changes within us. We need to have a change of focus. In Colossians chapter 3, it says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. We need to have a change from, from carnal mind into godly mind. Change from thinking about the things of the world to the things of, of God. And that doesn't mean that you only think about heaven all the time. Right? You, you have to still you know, think of some earthly things. You still have to wash your clothes and you still have to feed your kids. and Those things are important. In Bible school, they used to tell us, don't be so earthly minded that you're no heavenly good. And don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Mm-hmm. There's a nice medium place in there, right in the middle, and that's the place that we need to be. But we can't be too earthly minded, thinking only on the things of the world, the things that the world thinks about. First John 2, starting 15, it says, Do not love this world nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure. The craving for everything you see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. We're not supposed to love what the world has to offer. We're not supposed to focus on what the world has to offer. We are in the world, and that is something that we are going to see when we hear but that's not supposed to be where we're, where we're keeping the focus. Often it means what we're wa- uh, that we have to watch what we're putting in front of our eyes and what we're putting in our ears. There was a time in, in my walk where I had to stop listening to non-Christian music. Um, is secular music a sin? No, of course not. But that was something that God had impressed upon me specifically that that was something I needed to change. I, uh, I was a teenager, and I had just been to a youth conference, and something that was talked about had really impacted me, and they had been talking about sitting on the fence between being in the world and being a Christian. And it hit me so hard, because I had been sitting on that fence quite a bit. I was, uh, I grew up in the church, been a Christian for pretty much as long as I could remember, but I was trying to um, still live in the world, still do what my friends were doing, still listen to what they were listening to, and then on Sunday, be in church, be a good Christian girl. I was old enough to take ownership of my own faith. It was, wasn't what my parents believed anymore. It was what I believed. But when I was at that conference, God really spoke to me that I needed to get off that fence, either be hot or be cold. That, and that's one of the things that he pressed upon me was that I needed to stop listening to secular music. And that didn't mean that I stopped listening to secular music forever. I mean, you hear it everywhere. It's in shops and everywhere. I don't want to listen to it now, what I'm on the radio or whatnot. I prefer Christian music, but you know, you have to, sometimes you just hear it. But that for me was a change that I needed to make. I needed to stop putting things that were not good for me to be listening to into it. It was it wasn't helping me to know God, to know my Father. It wasn't drawing me closer to Him. And that is something that we need. We need to know God, to know our Father. In John 17, Jesus says, O oh, righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. The number one need of the church is to know the Father. 
no God. Because people don't know the Father, they are flesh fooled, like the physical, living for the things of the world. And the devil, the, the devil will do everything that he can to get you distracted. If he can distract you, you won't use that righteousness that we talked about before, that right standing with God. How do we get away from focusing on the things of the world? Well, we read it, we read it earlier. We need to renew our minds. And changing from a carnal mind or a flesh ruled mind to a godly one. We need to not be flesh ruled, we need to renew our minds, protect what we are letting in. We hear preachers talk about uh, allowing the, the watching what you allow out of your mouth, but we also need to watch what we are putting in to ourselves. Renewing your mind isn't just a a one and done type of thing. It's not a, oh, well, I have mean, renewed my mind on this day. I am good for the rest of the year. That's, that's not really how it works. It's a continuous process. We hear about faith all the time. You know, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word. Hearing, you have to hear, you have to hear. It's the same thing if you're reading your mind. You have to keep doing it. Mm. That is the way we need to renew your mind. If we are a three part being, your spirit, soul, body. Your spirit is your real you, it's the, the inner man. Your soul is your mind, your will, your emotions. Your body is you know, your earth suit. And when you were born again, your mind, your body didn't change at all. The only thing that changed with that first change part was the inner you. And yes, that was a complete change, complete turnaround, but your mind and your body nothing changed. That's something that you have to do continually. The real you on the inside is who's got changed. And when your outward man is stronger than your inward man, then that means that you are carnal or flesh old or an immature Christian. And renewing your mind, as I said, it's a continual process. And if you have not said no to <laughs> A thought recently, you're probably not keeping very good maintenance on your, on your thoughts. And you're probably not spending enough time renewing your mind. Because, as I said earlier, the devil is going to try and distract you. So we very much, last week, Pastor talked about what, the, uh, what this year is going to be and its growth through change and spiritual growth doesn't come with time in the body of Christ. In the physical, when, you, when, you, when you're a baby, you just grow. That's what happens over time. But as a Christian, you start off a baby, and you can stay a baby for 50 years. You don't make the decision to grow. Okay. And that takes us to our next change part. And that's uh, the third change part is we need to change from what we want and are interested in what God wants and what he's interested in. We need to have a heart after God's heart. And how do we know what God is interested in? What his heart is? Well, we can read about it in his word. God is also a three-part being, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and we can see all three in scriptures have a heart for the lost. It says in uh, John 3.16, for this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The father was so concerned about the lost that he sent his son. He wasn't willing that any should perish. That is why he sent his son to make a way for us. That is a, that is a huge gift. And then we can see how concerned Jesus was for the lost because he willingly allowed God to sacrifice him. God didn't make Jesus sacrifice himself. The Roman soldiers didn't make him sacrifice himself. It was his love for you and his love for me that sent him to the cross. It was his love for the lost person. His heart is for the lost. His whole reason for coming to earth was for the lost. There was no point in him coming to earth and dying except 
for the lost. The Holy Spirit, John 16, verse 7, says, But in fact, it is best for you that I go away. This is Jesus speaking. Because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father, and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. And then in Acts 1 8, it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. The Holy Spirit came to empower us to go, to reach the lost. If it wasn't important to God, he wouldn't have sent the Holy Spirit to give us the power to go. Being interested in the lost is also a process, not an event. You can't just say, oh, well, I'm going to go out and do this one outreach with the church, and then that's my uh, that's my quota for wanting to, to help the lost. It's, it's a continual thing as well. If we're going to have a heart after God's heart, we have to be interested in what he's interested in. Jesus said that the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Mm-hmm. And then he also said, go into the world and preach the good news to everyone. God's heart is for the lost. And the second thing we can see in the scripture that God's interested in is our spiritual growth. Mm-hmm. He wants you saved, and then he wants you to grow. Mm-hmm. Jesus left instructions to feed his sheep. In John uh, 21, he is speaking. He says, a third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. He was so impressing upon Peter that he wanted to, him to feed the sheep, to get them to grow. He told Peter this earlier in the chapter. Three different times he said, feed my sheep. It was important for him that people get saved and that they grow. Before we talked about having a carnal mind and being a carnal Christian, and that is being a, a baby Christian, you can have been a Christian for 30 years and still still be that baby. And in 1 Peter, it says, like newborn babies, you have prayed pure milk, uh, spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment. Babies grow out of the need for milk in the natural. You start off with a baby. Baby only has milk. And then at some point, baby needs more than just milk. Right? To the point there, they want the solid food, and eventually, they go on to meat. That's how we should be growing. We shouldn't want just the milk all the time. Milk is good, but milk shouldn't be our whole diet. We need to grow up in our faith to the point where we stop asking what God can do for us, but what we can do for God. And an immature Christian isn't going to ask that. An immature Christian is only going to say, oh, well, I need to be filled. I need what the preacher has. I need. Just like a baby. A baby doesn't care if anybody else gets fed. A baby wants the milk. When, you're, when you have a newborn at home and you're, that baby wants to eat, they let you know. And they don't care what you're doing, if you're eating or if you're taking a shower. They don't care. They want their milk. We need to get past that it's all about me stage. He wants us to grow spiritually. You are not going to have the same impact in the world if that you could if you were thinking just about how you can get that. We need to have a change of heart. Just because you're born again doesn't mean you are interested in what God is interested in. We need to have to have that change so that we are looking at what God wants to look at. That we're looking at the things that he's interested in. So what his heart is for, that becomes what our heart is for. 
Just because you've been a Christian forever doesn't mean that you're going to have a heart for what God has a heart for. That's not how it works. It's a conscious and continual decision to grow so that we're not focusing on ourselves, but on what God is interested in. First off, when we got born again, we have to have that change from a stony heart to a heart that's tender and cleaned by God. And then we have a change of heart from of what we put in front of ourselves, what we feed on. And we need to have a change of heart and our interests to change what we are interested in, what God is interested in. There's a song that has been in my heart since I started writing this message. I'm not going to sing it for you. Thank you. Um, but it says, change my heart, oh God, make it ever new. Change my heart, oh God, let me be like you. And I want that to be our heart cry. Change our heart. Whether it's growing spiritually, to have the same desires as God, or changing what we're looking at, letting into our lives, or making the biggest change of all and giving our life to Christ. We need to have that change of heart. And looking around, I can tell that um, we all have made that first, that first change of heart. But we are going to be putting this on YouTube. So if you're hearing this message and you don't, you haven't had that first change of heart, that I spoke about today and you haven't had that stony heart turned to a tender one, you can do that today. Or maybe you have made that decision in the past, but you walk away from God and you come back into a relationship with him. In Romans 10, it says, if you, only, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And for it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. All I have to do is repeat a prayer after me and believe it in your heart. So, will you repeat after me and if you want to? Lord, I repent of my sins. I turn away from living for me. I believe that you died on the cross for me. You were buried and rose again. I ask you into my heart. To be my personal Lord and Savior. Come and move in my life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen.